Okay, so today we'll be in class number thirteen and fourteen. Okay, so the next few classes will go a little longer than usual, but we'll try to cover some ground in these classes, and that's the purpose of having a little longer class. Okay, so today we'll start in the book of Joshua, and we'll see if we can finish even the book of Judges today. Okay, so that's our goal for today. So as we so for modern readers of the old testament perhaps no book is more troubling than the book of joshua okay and why is the book troublesome because the book poses disturbing theological moral and historical problems okay so we in the book of joshua <clears throat> so the theological aspect is the people of god wage a bloody campaign to wrest control of the promised land okay from the natives living there and they do so at god's command so it is god who is telling them go take possession of the land but there are already inhabitants over there so they have to snatch the land from the people already living over there okay so that's the theological aspect of the book of joshua now the moral aspect is that god commands not only war but a genocide okay now historical part is that to make matters worse or better the archaeological record in the holy land suggests that this great military campaign of command and conquest may have never happened okay <clears throat> so the book is named after the main character in the book Joshua the son of Nun who succeeded Moses as the leader of the people okay last class we saw that the leadership was passed on from moses to joshua and joshua was not moses son but yet it was passed on to him so in the sixth book of the old testament it's not so much about joshua okay as it is about the reentry of the chosen people into the land that god had once upon a time promised to abraham sarah and their descendants so in the book of genesis we see that abraham was already in the promised land okay and god had promised them this land now this book joshua talks about the way the israelites will reenter and take portions of this land <clears throat> so the book invokes many political and moral issues that are still relevant today in israel and palestine as well as land or nation where past immigration has brought about conflict between natives and immigrants or where present and future immigration is raising difficult questions so these questions include to whom does the land belong okay does it belong to the israelites or the inhabitants who should be considered citizens of a country okay how should competing populations interact with and regard each other so how are the israelites going to interact with, all, with the people already there like the canaanites philistines and others so should current countries regard past leaders who were once considered heroes in spite of and even because of atrocities that they may have committed during the war and many other similar question so basically joshua deals with how do we deal with immigration in a foreign land okay and especially with the ones or already in that particular land so as is the case with most books of the old testament the book of joshua is anonymous but its main human figure joshua is identified in the jewish talmud okay now the mishnah and the talmud are commentaries on the old testament the talmud is basically a commentary on the first part of the old testament so as the author of that book it bears its name 
So because of this, the Christian tradition, because this commentary says that Joshua is the author, okay, we consider Joshua to be the author of the book of Joshua, okay. So nowhere in the biblical book itself that Joshua mentions himself, nor does the book include passages that might seem to indicate it was written by the main figure. <clears throat> now the book of Joshua is composed of two main types of literature. One is theological historical narratives, that is chapters 1 to 12 and the last two chapters. And the major chunk, chapters 13 to 21, deals with the boundaries of each tribe. So each tribe is going to come to the promised land and Joshua is going to give them a portion of their promised land. So many times when we read the book of Joshua, okay, and we read and the initial stories are so good and we learn so much and then by the time we come to chapters 13 onwards the parceling of the land we find it difficult to read okay and we tend to pass on okay this portion of 13 to 21 now my goal in this class is to summarize this in such a way that you guys will get a brief understanding of what's going on in those chapters so first we see that there are five points, okay, and the presentation has messed up these numbering, but don't pay attention to that. There are five points. First, we have the introduction where there's a promise and exhortation to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1. And then in chapters 2 to 5, there, there are preparations and entrance into the promised land. Then chapter 6 to 12 is the way they conquest, a way they battle out to acquire the land and then 13 to 22 is the divisions of the land and then renewal of the covenant in the land okay now in those days in order to follow God people now and then now and then would always renew the covenant with God saying that we will <coughs> follow God okay so in the first chapter which is a promise and an exhortation to Joshua the book of Joshua begins with the Lord issuing Joshua both a promise and an exhortation, okay? So the promise is that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's the promise in chapter 1 verse 5. And then the exhortation for Joshua is be strong and courageous. So as he assumes leadership after Moses, God gives him a promise and an exhortation <clears throat> now in chapters 2 to 5 as they are preparing to enter the promised land Israel prepares to enter the promised land by sending two spies to the promised land or scouts so they go to Jericho to a fortified city when we say a fortified city uh, Jericho is a city surrounded by walls on all the sides and those walls were not just walls, but people used to live inside those walls. So therefore we call it a fortified city. So these scouts or these spies were sent to Jericho to a fortified city across the Jordan. Okay. Remember the Israelites are on the other side of the Jordan and Joshua sends two spies. He's just following in the footsteps of Moses. Moses has sent 12 spies to spy the land and he's doing just the same. So the two spies stay in the house of Rahab, a prostitute. The spies are identified or they are noticed and the king is notified. The king of Jericho orders the arrest of these spies. But Rahab in turn hides these two men and sneaks them out of the city. And she receives the promise that they will deal kindly and faithfully with her when Israel conquers the city. Okay. So Joshua chapter 3 describes Israel's crossing of the Jordan River into the land as a holy procession, okay? So the priests carry the Ark of the Covenant into the middle of the river and in an echo of miraculous deliverance of the people at the sea in Exodus 14, we see that in Exodus 14, the river parts and the people walk across on that dry ground and after the people cross, the priests continue on and the river resumes flowing. So as the people had crossed the Red Sea, here they are crossing a river. And in a similar fashion, the priests stand in the middle 
Uh, in that case, the priests go ahead and here they stand in the middle and the river resumes flowing after they come out of the river on the other side. So 12 stones are taken out of the river for each tribe and are set up as memoirs for the Lord had parted the water out of the Jordan and brought the people into the land. Okay. So here's a picture of, here's a painting of the people, the priest carrying the ark and they stand into the river and the river parts and the people cross. Okay. And the waters are flowing. So this is just a picture to depict what's happening over there. It's not a real picture, this is just a painting, okay? <clears throat> so, we see that the miracle, the point of the miracle is to establish Joshua as being divinely appointed, okay? When it occurred with Moses, Moses was divinely appointed and the people recognized Moses as their leader. And year after this happens, okay, they recognize that Joshua is the successor to Moses who had parted the waters of the sea. So having entered the land, all the males are circumcised because circumcision had not been practiced during the wilderness years, okay? And the people then celebrate the Passover. So they cross over, they circumcise themselves, they celebrate the Passover, okay? So the description of these rituals of circumcision and the Passover are theologically important because they symbolize that the people are God's covenant people. Okay, so in ritual good standing with both the Abrahamic covenant and the Sinaitic or Mosaic covenant. Okay, so they say that okay, we are going to follow this covenant. So the reason behind that being, I mean. They do the rituals saying that we are going to follow in the footsteps of the previous generations. Okay. So a striking story that closes the first section of the book is worth a special mention. Joshua has a vision of a man drawn with a sword. Okay. And we all know this. So Joshua inquires, are you one of us or one of our foes? And the man replies, neither. I am the commander of the armies of the Lord. Now I come. Okay. Now, why is this story so a special mention? Because the man then commands Joshua in an echo, like how Moses was before the burning bush. Remove the sandals from your feet for the place where you stand is holy. Okay. So here we see that Joshua also is having like a burning bush experience. Okay. So like Moses, the similarity Moses parts the sea, Joshua parts the river, both get authority after they have done their miracles, and then both have like a burning bush experience. Okay. <clears throat> so, but in the second part of the book, when we come to the conquest of the lands, chapters 6 to 12, according to the central section of the book of Joshua, Israel takes possession of the land by means of a violent military campaign, okay? They are not calm, they are not graceful, but they take the land by force, okay? And the narrative signals that the conquest of the land is not a human achievement, but a divine action for which Israel itself can take no credit, okay? This is all the Lord's doing, okay? So first, Israel conquers Jericho in chapter 6. The story of the fall of Jericho's walls is also described as a priestly procession of the sort that one might have expected at an Israelite religious festival. Okay, so these processions were common in our Israelite festivals. So they have seven priests that carry trumpets, which were shofars or hollow ram horns, and then they lead this Ark of the Covenant around the city. For the first few days, they had to go around the city just once, but on the seventh day, they had to go around the city seven times, okay? And then they blew, blew the horns, and then all the people were supposed to shout at the command of Joshua, and the walls came tumbling down, okay? And this, we know the story. So the Israelites are told to destroy the entire city, its residents, and all property, because they are devoted to the Lord, okay? So the reason over here is, that 
the reason why they were supposed to destroy the whole city because everything that belonged in the city was offered as a sacrifice to the Lord. So they had to destroy everything, okay? Except Rehab they let, who they dealt graciously because they she dealt graciously with the spies, okay? So now coming to the next chapter, chapter 7, okay? The conquest continues with the story of Achan, okay? And here we see Achan's sins in this chapter, okay? Achan had taken a cloak, he had taken 20 weights of silver, and he took a bar of gold from Jericho as spoils, okay? He disobeyed the Lord, okay? In doing so, he broke the commandment to destroy everything because it was devoted to the Lord, okay? So Joshua realized that someone had sinned when the scouts whom he sends ahead of the city to Ai are defeated and flee in fear, okay? That is not being strong and courageous, okay? So, Joshua knows that somebody has sinned because when the spies go to conquer the city of Ai, they are fearful, okay? And when these spies are fearful, Joshua knows that there is sin in the camp and somebody sins, okay? So, they identify the sin by drawing of lots, okay? And they bring each tribe and each family of each tribe in front of Joshua and we see that Achan in the end confesses when the Lord comes to Achan and his family Achan then confesses his sin and is executed outside the city so this story makes the point that Israel is not going to war for reasons of greed or economic gain okay now it's so funny that <coughs> with the in this battle God doesn't allow them to keep any of the spoils, but in the next battle, okay, he's going to allow them to keep the spoils, okay, of AI, okay. So Joshua urges them not to be dismayed and to be defeated and to defeat the city of AI in chapter 8. He then leads the people to victory over AI, which is totally destroyed, except this time the Lord allows them to keep the livestock of the city. So Joshua again renews the covenant with the Lord, okay. And we see that covenant renewal at that time was like a big thing, okay? At every point, if someone thinks he's fallen short of following the Lord, they would go before the Lord and say, Lord, I am wrong. I want to renew my covenant with you. And so here in Joshua chapter 9, we see that the Gibeonites, okay, pretend to be travelers from a far country and present themselves at the Israelite camp as guests, okay? So Joshua, following the norms of the law, extends hospitality and makes a covenant of peace with them. And when their trickery is known, Joshua abides by the covenant, okay? He knows of the trickery and he could have destroyed them, but Joshua has made a covenant with them and thus disobeying the Lord's command to purge the land of foreign people. So Joshua disobeys the laws, but he curses them verbally okay so next after AI there are five kings that get into war with Joshua and his group okay so the conquest narrative continues with the story of the defeat of these five kings who had allied so five kings said let's join and let's become allies because these guys, Gibeon, they knew already that Israel was strong. So they allied with Israel. So the force clash at Gibeon where the Lord threw them into a panic and the Lord hurled huge stones on them from the sky and caused the sun to stand still in the heavens. Okay, Joshua chapter 10. Great story. Okay, so the conquest story then climaxes as Joshua defeats city after city and king after king. So first in the southern part of the land and then in the northern part, accumulating with the city of Hazor. Okay, so Joshua chapter twelve lists the kings. Okay, Joshua conquered, but chapter thirteen describes the yet unconquested, conquered parts of the land. So here we see that this is the Sea of Galilee, this is the Jordan Valley, this is the Dead Sea, Israel is on this part of the map. And Joshua and the group enter from here, 
okay and this is the first conquest they go up right up to Shekim and they come here to Lord of Giza that's the first part they then they come down over here and they come right down here to this part closer to Egypt and closer to Gaza this is the second conquest and the third conquest they go up over here and they end over here at Hazor okay so this is the way that Joshua is conquering city after city after city at the Lord's command. Okay, so this is a he calls this a a three fucked invasion. Okay, so this is a three fucked invasion by Joshua. He comes. I'll explain it to you again. He comes again over here. He goes up to check him. He comes back. He goes down to Giza. Then from Giza he goes here. Blackish, he goes to Hebron and then he comes down and he conquers town after town after town. And then on top, he goes up over here and he comes down to Hazel. Okay. <clears throat> now, the division of the land, okay, this part, the 13th to the 22nd, okay, the part that nobody wants to read in the book of Joshua. Okay. So, Joshua chapter 13 to 21 describes the division of the land among the tribes. Okay. This is the actual part where Joshua is going to dish out the land to the tribes with small sections of the narrative there are small narratives interspersed and a few elements are of special note okay so the first thing to notice the way he partitions the land is he's going to give Reuben, Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh territories on the east of the Jordan River the Trans Jordan okay so so this is the Dead Sea and this is the Jordan Valley, if you can see these, this, this line. And this is the Sea of Galilee. Israel is on this side. But the first thing he does, he's going to give the half tribe of Manasseh. He's going to give Gad and he's going to give Reuben the Trans Jordan. Okay, that I've been explaining to you all these classes. The Trans Jordan, they were settled in the Trans Jordan. But they will only get this land after they finish helping these tribes battle out for their lands okay so that is the first part okay the second part is that there is a, a fault line going in from here like this right up to here okay Canaan right going like this and it separates Judah from Ephraim okay so this is the northern part of Israel this is the southern part okay Basically, it will be divided into two kingdoms later on, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. But for now, there's a fault line going and Judah is on the bottom and Ephraim is on the top. And we see also that in chapters, so the second is a fault line division of the territories, Jordan between Judah in the south and Ephraim in the north. Okay, so that was that. And the third chapters, 20 and 21, describe the cities of refuge. Okay. So, the, what are the cities of refuge, okay? They were allotted to the Levites especially, okay? Now, the cities of refuge, if somebody committed an uh, accidental crime unintentionally, they could run to these cities of refuge and they were saved. And these cities were governed by their smaller laws, okay? But these cities were also given to the Levites, okay? And in 2021, six cities of refuge were part of the system to which the accused murder could flee and receive until they could have a trial okay they were allowed only to go to the cities until they got a fair trial okay they were not saved completely they were still accused being there they could get a fair trial okay and the trial was arranged by the elders of these cities okay now because the priestly tribe of Levi did not receive a tribal territory. They were allotted towns within the territory of the other tribes. Okay, so the Levites, okay, were divided into four groups. The descendants of Aaron, okay, were the main group, and they received cities within the tribes of Judah, Simeon, and Benjamin. Okay, so they received cities in Judah, Benjamin okay and Simeon okay Judah Benjamin and Simeon okay this was
Aaron, the descendants of Aaron. Okay. Then after the descendants of Aaron, okay, we have the Koalites, okay, and their received cities within the tribes of Ephraim, Dan, and half of Manasseh. Okay. So Dan, Ephraim, and this half of Manasseh. Okay. These are the Koalites, okay. Half Manasseh, Ephraim, and Dan. Then we have the Gershonites, they served and received cities in the tribes of Ichakar, Asher, Naphtali, and the half tribe of Manasseh. Okay, so Ichakar, Naphtali, Asher, and this half tribe. Okay, and then this last tribe, okay, Merites, they served and received the cities within the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and Zebulun. Okay, so Reuben, Gad, and Zebulun. Okay. So if you see, okay, why is this? <laughs> that the Levites, they occupied at least one city in all the tribal area. Okay, and this was the way the tribes were scattered over Israel and in the Trans Jordan. Now, in the last chapters of the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 23 and 24, in the final section of the book, Joshua describes two nations, two national gatherings in which Joshua, now at the end of his lives, life, leads the people in renewing the covenant and committing to serve the Lord. So in the first gathering, Joshua exhorts the people to be very steadfast and to observe and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses so that you may not be mixed with these nations okay so there are two gatherings the first one was we have to keep our tribe or our clan pure so we shouldn't mix with the with our neighbors and the purpose of doing that is to love the lord your god okay verse 11 of the chapter then in the second gathering we see that joshua renews his vow and he reviews Israel's history also in a long speech that is typical of the Deuteronomic history. And then he challenges the people to choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord in chapter 24, verse 15. And then the book ends with the reports of the deaths of Joshua and Aaron's son, Eliezer, okay, a figure mentioned often in Joshua and the report of the burial of Joseph's bones in the land. Okay, remember Genesis, Joseph said that request, that, can you bury my bones in the land? So here we see that in Joshua chapter 24, Joseph's bones are now finally brought to the promised land and put over there. So the report of the burial of Joseph completes the linking of the book of Joshua to the Pentateuch, okay? So now theological themes, okay? So the first theme is God's faithfulness to the divine promises okay now in this first in genesis chapter 12 we see in the first three verses that the lord promises abraham three things and i mentioned this before he says i'll give you a land i'll give you many descendants who would be a great nation and those descendants would be blessed to be a blessing so there's a land there are descendants and there's a blessing okay and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Okay, that's the blessing. Okay, so throughout the book of Genesis, these ancestral promises are repeated and renewed over and over again. Okay, if you read the book of Genesis, I mentioned this before. Every time God renews a promise, he'll say a little more of the promise or he'll remind, you know, the folks involved of the promise that he made to the previous generation or the previous person. Okay, so at the start of the book of Deuteronomy, Moses again reminds the people of the promise. The Lord your God spoke to us at Horeb, saying, See, I have set the land before you. Go in and take possession of the land that I swore to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and to give to them and to their descendants after them. Okay, so this is Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 6 and 8. And then we see that God's promise of the land is a major theme in the first five books of the Bible, okay? So as the book of Joshua begins that promise, 
it's about to be tested and fulfilled. So the great nation of Israel and its new leader Joshua stand on the verge of entering or should I say re-entering the promised land. So God says to Joshua, every place that your sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given it to you as I promised to Moses. Okay, chapter 1 verse 3. So by the end of the book, Israel has taken possession of the land. Although many foreign families still reside in the land, the Canaanites have not been completely driven out. Okay. So while these guys took possession of the land, they were to drive out all these other people out of the land. Okay. And they failed miserably at doing that. Okay. <clears throat> so God proves faithful. Okay. To the promises made to Abraham, Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob and Leah and Rachel and Moses. And many, many years have passed since the first promise was made to Abraham. The people had left the land because of famine and had been enslaved. Okay. Remember all this. And they had been freed by the Lord and had wandered in the wilderness. And now they are in the land. The Lord has proven faithful to the divine promises to Abraham and Sarah. But at what cost? Okay. Like, what is the cost? Okay. It costs many people their lives, many people their towns, many homes. Like, all those things are gone now. Okay. The inhabitants of the land. Now, the second <coughs> thing we look at is violence in God's name and by God's command. Okay. Now, in the book's opening verses, there is no explicit mean mention of violence. Okay. As the book opens, although God hints at what is coming when he says, no one shall be able to stand against you in chapter 1 verse 5. Okay. But that soon changes. Okay. So the residents of the city of Jericho closed their gates against the invading armies of the Israelites and following the seven-day procession of trumpet-playing priests around the city, the Lord brings down the walls of Jericho in an act of divine violence. The people shout, the trumpets were blown and the walls fall down flat and the people okay, go down to the city and captured capture the city and they're devoted to destruction by the edge of the sword and everyone who is in the city, men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep and donkeys, they all were destroyed. Okay. <clears throat> so the only the household of the prostitute Rahab who had saved the two spies is spared. She becomes part of the people and even an ancestor to King David and Jesus. She is mentioned in Matthew's gene genealogy of Jesus okay in the opening chapter of the New Testament so having committed and commanded violence at Jericho the Lord then commanded the violence to continue at AI in chapter 8 Hazar chapter 11 and elsewhere the book is explicit that God not only tolerated violence in his service but also commanded it and even personally performed it okay so closely related to the theme, okay, this is the third part, the land and its conquest. So closely related to the theme of divine sanctioned violence is Joshua's, in Joshua is the theme of divinely blessed conquest of the land. So as already noted, the book begins with the people standing on the verge of entering the promised land. By the end of the book, they occupy the land and move into the areas allocated, which we just went through. The individual tribes with certain cities designated for refuge and for the Levites. <clears throat> so the story of Joshua is told from perspective of the people of Israel. From this perspective, the conquest of the ancient Israel was the resettling of the promised land by the people to whom it justly belonged. Okay. So it belonged to the Israelites and therefore they had to go to war with all these unknown people who had come in and occupied the land. Okay. And therefore God had, you know, justly told them to go in and, you know, take what was theirs. <clears throat> so from the perspective of the Canaanites who are living in the land already, the story, story probably would have been told very differently. Okay. So the Israelites were almost, it was almost always a small vulnerable people who were themselves constantly being invaded, enslaved and oppressed. So the issue of who has the right 
to live and possess the promised land or any land for that matter is an issue that resonates still today okay but just to focus on the issue of the land of israel who has the right to live there okay so following a revolt against rome this happened in ad 132 okay jews were banned from they were stopped from living into jerusalem for some time then many jews joined their relatives who had already moved to foreign lands and then the jewish presence was always maintained in the promised land over centuries and then we see that you know after the crusades the jews became a minority in the promised land and that reality started to shift in the 1800s 1900s and especially after world war 2 when many jews migrated back to the land so even how one describes this migration is fraught with tension were these modern jewish immigrants returning to the land or were they invading it okay do groups have rights to migrate across borders if so what gives them that right okay do nations have rights and responsibilities to control their borders who has the right to declare a border these are difficult questions that persist to present to us in scripture okay so number 4 the leadership of god's people okay so the book of joshua begins with the words after the death of moses these words may remind readers of what happened the last time people were left without the leadership when moses went up into the mountain in chapter 32 we see that the israelites build a golden calf with aaron and the people because they panicked they wanted to see a god in a form of some idol so they build a golden calf to represent the presence of the lord in violation of the first commandment okay worship they worship the graven image of the calf as if it was the lord okay so a fundamental theme of the book of joshua is leadership when the people have good leadership they thrive when people have poor leadership they suffer okay So the book of Joshua is often seen as a story of leadership according to the book's introduction after the death of Moses the Lord spoke directly to Joshua and commanded him be strong and courageous and he not told told him just once he told him thrice in the first chapter and the first time Joshua was to be strong and courageous in leading the people to take possession of the land okay in verse 6 the second time he was to be courageous was to act in accordance with all the law that my servant Moses commanded you to do do not turn from it to the right or to the left and meditate on it day and night okay so that's the second one okay and the third one is Joshua was to be strong and courageous by not being afraid okay do not be afraid Joshua it's the lord that is going to help you so at the end of Joshua the people of Israel themselves also exhort Joshua to be strong and courageous okay so three times there's a promise given to be strong and courageous in chapter 1 so the fifth part is the need to renew the covenant okay so an important theological issue in the book of Joshua is the need for the covenant with the lord to be renewed from time to time at least once in each generation okay so like how we have today like every generation has to confess their faith faith believe on the lord so in that time we see that in the book of Joshua that every generation okay had to renew their covenant with the lord so twice in the book joshua leads the people in worship and that ritual looks like a renewal of the covenant okay so in joshua chapter 8 verses 30 to 35 okay following the defeat and destruction of the city of ai and acting in accordance with the law of moses joshua builds an altar writes a copy of the law on the stones and reads the entire law to the people and then the levitical priest bless the people so that's the first time they renew the covenant okay and then again at the end of the book joshua calls the people to recommit themselves to following the lord okay after gathering the people and narrating the long history of the lord's saving acts on the people's behalf joshua calls the people to choose the day whom you will serve but as for me and the household we will serve the lord okay 
So, it is often said that the people of God are always one generation away from extension, extinction, meaning that if the people of God do not pass on the faith to the next generation, the children and the grandchildren, this community of faith can cease to exist within one or two generations from that. So perhaps no book of the Bible or story of the Bible makes this point more clearly than the stories of renewal of the covenant in Joshua 8 and 23 and 24. So according to Joshua, the relationship between the Lord and the people requires renewal. Such renewal is an act of worship that includes blessing and offering, attending to the words of scripture and the articulation of commitment between the Lord and the people. This is something that we do every Sunday, okay? Come before the Lord, worship Him. But in those days, because they were traveling and they were going from town to town, this at least once in your generation you had to come before and worship the Lord and listen to what the Lord had to say, okay? So that is the book of Joshua. Okay, so that is our first class. Take a five minute break. Then we'll come back for the second class on the book of Judges. The they go up and then they come back towards the Jericho. So they go towards Mount uh, Hebron, I think. No, I have one interesting. So the last part I have shown you, know, they come to Jericho and they go yeah, up. They go up and yeah. then they come, they yeah. come back. Because so they are driving 40 years. Yeah, yeah. And then, after this, then they come into the land of uh, the promising. But what is this uh, Malaysia, which is from this side, is another side of the That is half, half prime of Malaysia. So, half prime of Malaysia is being on this side. Yeah. Half, uh, so, two and a half tribes on this side, and the other. Other, I think, uh, nine and a half. Yeah. Mm.
Okay, so back to the book of Joshua, uh, Judges. <clears throat> so not all characters are role models. And not all stories provide the reader with a holy moral meaning. For those readers who expect or hope to find holy characters and morality in the Bible, the book of Judges can be a very confusing book. Okay, and we'll see in the next few minutes why is that. So, on one hand, there are some stories that read like heroic sagas of the founders of any given nation. The story is of Othniel, Ehud, Deborah and Barak, Jael and Gideon might fit in this bill, okay? But then on the other hand, the book of Judges retells stories that are troubling, okay? And even horrifying. And these stories are not just about Israel's Canaanite neighbors, but about Israel itself, okay? So the stories of Abimelech, Jephthah and his daughter, Samson and Delilah, and the rape of the Levite's wife are some such stories. And we'll come to them one by one. So what kind of literature is the book of Judges? The book of Judges is about two things. First, the book casts a narrative about the fallen and sinful condition of humanity. Okay, So the book describes what happens to human communities when they are left on their own without any rule or law or governing authority. Okay, So in the book of Joshua, we see that, you know, when there's leadership, everything's okay. When there's no leadership, everything's not okay. And here in this book, we see that, you know, without leadership, okay, everything is chaotic, okay? So the book sums up in the final verse that in those days, there was no king in Israel and the people did what was right in their own eyes, okay? So the second thing that the book portrays, okay, or answers is the question of whether Israel can serve the Lord, okay? So recall that the book of Joshua ends with the covenant renewal ceremony in which Joshua says, choose the day whom you shall serve, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. That is in Joshua 24 verse 15. So the people reply, okay, eagerly saying, we also will serve the Lord for he is our God. But then Joshua replies them, okay, and this is the main part, okay. You cannot serve the Lord, okay, or Joshua tells them, you cannot serve the Lord, okay, for he is a holy God, okay, and the people respond again, no, we will serve the Lord. So what Joshua is telling the people in the closing renewal vow is that you folks, your guys cannot serve, okay. And we are about to witness that in the book of Judges, that this is a people who at every given opportunity, they are the ones that cannot serve the Lord, okay? So thus the end of the book of Joshua sets up the plot for the narrative arc that spans from Joshua through first and second Kings, okay? So the question is, can the people serve the Lord? The book of Judges answers that question. When organized as a loose tribal confederation led by charismatic judges, Israel cannot serve the Lord, at least not consistently. Okay, so the book makes this argument by telling the story of a nation of people that fairly healthy at the start of the book, but descends into moral squalor by the book's end. Okay, so the book is named for the series of human judges who rise up to judge Israel, okay? So the so-called judges who lead Israel are more often are deliverers or saviors, okay? They're given the name judge, but the way they function, they function as a deliverer, okay? So these leaders were primarily political and military figures rather than legal figures. So the verbal form of the word judge occurs often, but is used more as a synonym for the rule rather than as a technical term for making a legal decision, okay? So for example of Othniel, the first judge, it is said the spirit of the Lord came upon him and he judged Israel and he went out to war and the Lord gave King Cushan 
of Aram into his hand. So the land had rest for 40 years. So chapter 3 verses 10 to 11. So the word translated judged here could be replaced by ruled or reigned. Okay. So during the years in which these judges ruled Israel, they would have had a legal function to meditate disputes and make judgment over legal matters. So here we see that there's King Solomon and he has to make a judgment between, you know, deciding the mother of a baby. And when we think of King Solomon, we think that these judges are like that, okay? They have to preside over these matters, okay? But we see only one person in the book of judges having that kind of matter brought to her, like making a decision in a certain matter and it's only Deborah, okay? Who helps resolve disputes, okay? So we see that in one instance in which a crime is committed, an aggravated party calls for judgment. The case of rape and murder of the Levite's wife that we see in chapter 19. And all the people heard the Levite's complaint and then declared the community of Gibeah guilty. Okay, so in other words, the only time there is actual judgment, a judge does not preside or make the legal decision. Okay. So, here we see, as is the case with most books of the Old Testament, the book of Judges is anonymous. Judges is part, is part of the long narrative section of the Old Testament called the historical books, which spans from Joshua to Esther. Okay. So, here we see that the book is divided into five, six parts. First, the failure to conquer the land. Okay. Second is judgment. We see Joshua's death, Israel's infidelity. Then we have the first set of judges, okay, these guys. Then we have Abimelech's attempt to reign as king. Then we see that there's a second set of judges, okay, Tola, Jer, Jephna, and all these guys. And then we have anarchy, chaos, and injustice, okay, as the last part of the book of Judges. So, <clears throat> If we look at the genre of the book of Judges, Judges is made up mostly of theological historical narratives, but it also includes a prominent hymn, the hymn of Deborah in Judges chapter 5, as well as descriptions of the land, the tribes, and the non-Israelites who lived within its borders. Okay. <clears throat> so the first part in chapter 1, okay, as the book of Joshua describes the way, you know, the tribes were going and conquering the land. The book of Judges opens in chapter 1 with the failures of every tribe, okay? What they failed to do as they conquered the land, okay? So the book of Judges begins by essentially contradicting one of the main narrative claims of the book of Joshua. If one reads Joshua na naively, the sense is that with the exceptions of the Gibeonites, Jezubites and a few other Israel's conquest of the land was virtually complete, okay? That is what we get a sense like that. But Israel is totally pos totally possessed the land and almost all of the Canaanites were driven out or killed, okay? But Judges chapter 1 calls the narrative into question, okay? Beginning with the tribe of Judah, the chapter describes how the various tribes defeated some Canaanite tribes but not the others. Know that there were many foreign people still in the land that Israel continued to struggle against. Some were defeated after Joshua, others were not. Particularly worth noting are all of the Canaanite tribes that persisted in the land even after the battles that followed Joshua's life. Okay. So the land was covered mostly with Canaanites. Okay. And chapter 1 describes everyone's failure in detail okay so the benjamites for example did not drive out the jesuits okay chapter 1 verse 21 manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of betshin and its villages or tanach and its villages or the inhabitants of dor and inhabitants so here we see that manasseh did not drive out part of its inhabitants then we see that ephraim did not drive out the canaanites who lived in gezer so the Canaanites lived among them in Gezer. So we see the Benjamites, Manasseh, Ephraim, 
that we see Zebulun did not drive out the inhabitants of Kithron and, and we see again over there the Can Canaanites lived among them. Okay. Then we see a Asher, Asher did not drive out the inhabitants of Akko or the inhabitants of Sidon or Alab or Aklib or all these guys. And then Naphtali did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh or the inhabitants of Beth and lived among the Canaanites. So as you see that as these guys have not driven out all these people, they are living among these Canaanite people. Okay, so, so here we see that judgment and Joshua's death and Israel's infidelity is in chapter 2 and 6 verses of chapter 3. So Judges chapter 3 contains a list of all the people that Israel did not drive out of the land and they are the Philistines and Canaanites, they are the two big ones. And then we have the Sidonians, Hevites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, and Jezebites. So, so obviously from the perspective of the book of Judges, they took their daughters as wives for themselves and their own daughters they gave to their sons and they worshipped their God. That was how corrupt <clears throat> the nation of Israel had become. Okay. So in familiar fashion, the book also begins with the death of the character of the previous book, in this case Joshua. So Judges uses the death of Joshua to introduce a theological laden syndrical view of history. So the people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and the elders who outlived him and who had seen the great things the Lord had done for Israel. Chapter 2 verse 7, but then another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Okay, so the book then describes a cycle of faithlessness, punishment, cries for help, divine deliverance and peace that would happen during the period of the judges. So the Israelites, okay, then the Israelites did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and worshipped the Baals and they abandoned the Lord. Okay, so on one side they worshipped false gods and the other side they Abandon the true and living God. So we see in chapter 2 verse 14. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he gave them over to the plunders who plundered them. Then the Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the power of those who plundered them. And whenever the Lord raised up judges for them. The Lord was with the judge and he delivered them from the hand of the enemies. Okay. And then, but whenever the judge died, they would relapse and behave worse than the ancestors following the other gods and worshipping and bowing down of them. Okay. So I want you guys to note down these verses. Okay. This verse, this one, this one, this one. Okay. Write them all down. And I want you to draw a cycle. Okay. Of what is happening and submit. There's a cycle going on in the book of Judges. Okay. And this is the first time there's a cycle. Okay. You can draw, write down whatever is happening over here. And I'm going to mention to you what the cycle is, okay? Right now I'm going to mention, but you all have to write down the cycle and bring it next time as an assignment, okay? So, the cycle begins, okay, over here, is the Israelites did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, okay? What is the verse? Hold on, hold on. The verses are mentioned over here. Four verses, okay? But there's a repeated cycle, okay? Every time there's a judge and every time the judge dies, the people go back to the old ways. So they did what was, they did their own thing. The anger of the Lord came upon them, okay? Then the people prayed, okay? There's a in between. The people, when the anger came upon the Lord, there's a missing part over here. There's the anger came upon the Lord. They called upon the Lord. The Lord raised up judges. The judges delivered them. And then we see that when the judge died, they go back to the same. Okay. You got the assignment? So, whenever there's a judge on the scene, there's a repeated cycle in the book of. There's a cycle that goes on. Okay. And 
I'm going to now tell you all judge after judge after judge, okay? And the story will be a familiar story because all these points are there in every story. People are doing their own things. The anger of the Lord comes against them. People then remember the Lord. They call upon the Lord. The Lord sends the judge. The judge dies. And then the people do everything that is... So, read chapter 2 of the book of Judges and tell me what's the cycle that's going on over there, okay? So, that's the sign. So, now the first set of Judges, okay? If you want us to read it, I want us to write on Read it first. How will you know what is there without reading? Yes, sir. Reading and then writing. Yeah, yeah. But don't write a comprehensive. Just write the steps over there. Okay. Only the steps. Don't give me all history and all components of things. I know everything. What are you going to write? I know also. So, only... So we don't have to write anything on <laughs> No, I have to see. We all guys know what the cycles are going on. Like a flow chart. Yeah, like a flow chart. Okay. Or like a, like a circle and like what is the like a repeated okay. thing. Okay. And if everybody writes this, okay, it won't be on the midterm. Okay. So, it won't be on the midterm. Okay. This portion won't be on the midterm, okay? So, <laughs> the first set of judges, okay? We come to the first set of judges. The story of each judge, okay, follows the pattern that I just mentioned. So, sometimes there are no stories about a particular judge. For example, Judge Shamgar, okay? The book simply states that he struck down 600 Philistines with an animal prod. He too rescued Israel in chapter 3 verse 31 was simply regarding the judges Tola and Jair okay so after Abel Malik Tola the son of Pua son of Dulu a man of it, lived at Shamir in the hill country of Ephraim rose to deliver Israel he judged Israel 23 years then he died and was buried in Sham so here are judges that nothing is mentioned about them only what they did and after him came Jair the Gilead, who judged Israel 22 years, and he had 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys, and they had 30 towns which are in the land of Gilead and are called. So, Jair died and was buried in Camon. Okay, so all these are not important. Okay, so, so the stories of other judges are also told briefly without detail. An example of this is the first judge, Othniel. Okay. And this is one of the important judges. And it was said that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he judged Israel. He went out to war and the Lord gave King Cushan of Aram into his hands. And for other judges, very long stories are also told. Okay. Now the long story ones are, we'll come to them in a few minutes. First we have Ehud and he's raised up to free Israel from the obese king and we all know this king Eglon of Moab so Ehud straps a short sword okay in his right thigh okay and after delivering the taxes to Eglon he slips back in to see the king he takes out the sword and he puts it into his fat belly and his belly is so fat that the fat of his belly covers that dagger okay <coughs> So that is Ehud, okay? So during the period of Judges, according to one theory, when any of the tribes were threatened by a foreign people, okay? So if any of the tribes got in trouble, a judge would sound a call for arms, okay? When a call was made, all the tribes were supposed to respond and unite together and defend against these foreign people, okay? So when King Jabin of Hazor which is in the northern part of the country, oppressed the people. Deborah of Ephraim, who was a judge, sounds the call to arms and the tribes of Zebulun, Naphtali and all the other tribes, okay? Except the tribes of Reuben, Gad and Dan and Asher do not respond, but the other eight tribes respond and Judah and Simeon are also not mentioned, but some speculate that this is because they were already at war. So six tribes respond, okay? As many tribes were free, responded, and we see that at this tribal alliance, as it is best, Deborah and Barak defeat Javan's army 
and his general, Caesarea slips away and takes refuge in the tent of a Canaanite woman, okay? And here we see that there's a hero over here, Jael, okay? And she's a woman, and in the night, Jael, you know, goes to the general, and he take, she takes a peg and hammers it into his temple, okay? With a hammer. Then we see that with the death of Deborah, okay, the Midianites come on the scene, and this is one of the most famous stories in the Book of Judges. The, the Midianites, and they try to oppress the Israel, Israelites. So the Lord chooses Gideon of the western half of the tribe of Manasseh. So Manasseh, which is in Israel, he's from that tribe, okay? And we see that he is a judge and warrior, and Gideon demands various signs that assures that the Lord will be with him. For example, the most famous of the sign is the fleece. He leaves it on the ground overnight and it's dry and it is full of dew. The ground is dry and it's full of the fleeces wet in the morning. And the next day, there's a repeat. The ground is wet and the fleece is, the fleece is dry and the ground is wet, okay? So Gideon goes into battle with 32,000 men. God says, you know, if you wanted to do it on your own, then you take 32,000, but these troops are too much for me. So, so what he does is that the Lord decides that Gideon has too many troops. So he commands that anyone afraid, afraid of the battle, go home and 22,000 out of the 30,000 return home and still left with how many? 10,000. So with 10,000 left also, it's still too many troops for Gideon to work with, okay? So the Lord commands that everyone, they go down to a brook and everyone drink from a spring and the troops who scoop out water into their mouths, okay? Like how we have a, a yeah. custom, right? Like some household, it's not in my household, but in some household, people drink water while, you know, like this. So people who bent into the brook and scooped water and drank like that. They were all supposed to go home. But people who made a fool out of themselves and drank like dogs and bent down and lapped the water straight out of the spring, they were to stay, okay? So in the end we see, huh? What are you saying? Any questions? What's the question? Lizzie, what's the question? Okay, so, here we see that all the troops who scoop water into their mouths with their hands are sent home and those who humiliate themselves by lapping up water like dogs are allowed to stay, okay? So just 300 remain and with those 300 water lapping soldiers, Gideon defeats the Midianites and pursues and slays their kings, okay? So then the, the Israelites ask Gideon to rule over us, okay? you and your son and your grandson also. They make a request of Gideon. And it is that they ask him to rule as king in chapter 8 verse 22, but Gideon refuses but asks each to contribute a golden earring. Okay? And then we see that he forges the gold into an F nod, an object of clothing used to, you know, divine the will of God, and he sets it up on his hometown and the Israelites eventually worship the F nod rather than the guys pay attention. So here we see that they start worshiping an idol by the time the the end of Gideon the part of Gideon happens. Okay? So <clears throat> so in chapter nine, okay, as Gideon dies, okay, chapter nine tells the story of Abelah. Abimelech, whose name can mean my father's king. So this is one of Gideon's 70 sons. So Gideon had refused the kingship when it was offered to him, but Abimelech, his son, wants this kingship. So he slays 68 of his brothers and is declared king by at least part of the tribe of Manasseh. Okay. And we see only the youngest of the 70 sons, okay, Jotham survives. Okay. So there's one son that survives. He curses Abimelech and those who made him king. So civil war breaks out between Abimelech 
and his nobles. And when Abimelech besieges a tower, a woman throws down a millstone from the top of the tower, killing him. Okay. So the, that's the first set of judges. Now in the second set of judges, we see that Jephthah of Gilead is a mighty warrior and son of parents not married to each other. Okay. So he's a son of a man named Gilead by a prostitute. And we see that the Jephthah's half-brothers drive him away from home where he becomes the leader of a band of outlaws. Okay. So when the Amorites oppress Israel, they ask this guy Jephthah to deliver them. So Jephthah agrees so long as they receive him as their head, they should be victorious. So the text says that the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, bringing him to the edge of Ammon. <clears throat> so there he makes a rash vow to the Lord, if you will give me the Amorites into my hand, then whoever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return victorious from the Amorites, I shall, it, they shall be offered up by me as a burnt offering. Okay. So this is his bold claim. So the Lord gives Jephthah victory. And then when he returns, his daughter is the first person to come out of the house. But the daughter asks for two months to bewail my virginity. So in the mountains with her friends. So when she returns, Jephthah fulfills his vow. But no one in the story does. It suggests that the Lord approves of Jephthah's vow or expects him to fulfill it. So during Jephthah's literally short 60 years, Six year time as judge, civil war and dissension begin to break out within Israel. Okay. So Samson is the last judge and the narrative of his is mentioned in chapters 13 to 16 that recounts the story. He's born in the southern eastern tribe of Dan to an unnamed woman during a time when the Philistine oppressed the Israelites. So we see that Samson is delegated to the law as a Nazareth. It's a special class of worshippers whose vows include no alcohol and no cutting of hair. Okay, so Samson he's filled with violence, violence, and he's described as killing many people and visiting a Philistine prostitute. Okay, so he wants to marry a Philistine woman. His father objects, but arranges to marry him anyway. So at the wedding feast, Samson bets 30 Philistines that they cannot solve his riddle. The Philistines goad Samson's wife into coaxing the answer from Samson and thus are able to win the bet. In anger, Samson kills 30 men and uses the spoils to pay off the bet. His wife is then given to Samson's companion, but he later returns for her. When her father refuses him, Samson sets, the, sets fire to the Philistine city and then war ensures and then Samson is victorious and judges Israel. Okay, so that is Samson's story. And then Samson meets and falls in love with a woman named Delilah who may have been either Philistine or Israelite. We don't know. The Philistines, the Philistine bride Delilah discovers the source of his strength, inhuman strength such that it such that he cannot be kept in bonds even when Delilah has Samson bound in the middle of the night okay so after several lies about how to bind him he finally reveals his secret that it is in his uncut hair that his strength comes from there and then one night Samson falls asleep with his head in Delilah's lap and then when he awakes, we see that his hair has been shaved. He's bound this time and cannot break loose. So the Philistines bind Samson and set him to, to hard service and bondage, turning a great milestone to grind grain. But milestone to grind grain. But his hair begins to grow back. They bring him out to be mocked at a great Philistine worship service, celebrating his bondage. But then his strength has returned and he pushes down the pillars of the temple in which they are worshipping, killing himself and the Philistine captors. So that was the last judge. So we see that in chapter 17 to 21, there's anarchy, chaos and injustice. 
and we see that Judges 17 tells the same story of a man named Micah, okay? And here in chapter 17, we see that Micah steals silver from his mother and when she curses the silver, he returns it to her. She then forges it into an idolist's image and then he installs one of his sons, not a Levitical priest, as a priest. And then we see a Levite from Bethlehem comes to live with Micah who assumes the Lord will cause him to prosper now that the Levite is his priest. So here we see that there are these various judges and as you can see that every there are judges from the various tribes and when a judge comes on the scene, okay, like Jer, okay, for example, we are only concerned with Manasseh in the picture. We are not concerned with the whole of the Israelite nation, okay. Samson also when he comes, we are only concerned with this part, Dan, okay. So, most of these judges, okay, come from these various tribes and as we read the book of Judges, we have to keep in mind that the picture is shifting from tribe to tribe. It's not covering the whole land, but judges are ruling over these different tribes and at different times, okay? <clears throat> so we see that in chapter 18, it says that in those days, there was no king in Israel and this tells how the tribe of Dan migrates from the southeastern portion of the land, perhaps to escape the Philistines who live nearby. And some Danites set out to find a new home. And along the way, they steal Micah's idol, okay, and pursued his priest to join them. Then the Danites travel to the far northeast portion of the land where they settle and set up the idol, okay. So Judges chapter 19, it recounts what may be the most terrifying text of terror, the rape of a Levites. So this is the most horrifying story in the whole book. That's what I want to say. So it's about a Levite's concubine. A concubine is nothing but a sexual partner, partner who has legal status, but not full legal status of marriage. Okay, he's like married to her, but he's not the wife. Okay, so the Levite and the concubine are on their way to his home in Ephraim. When an old man extends them hospitality, they stay overnight at his house in the village of Gibeah in Benjamin, okay? Gibeah they stay at. And then that night a band of Benjamites, described as the sons of perversion, demand that the priests be sent out so that they can rape him, okay? Look at the adverse things that are happening over there. They demand that the priests be sent out so they can rape him. The priest throws the concubine, his concubine out of the house and the men rape her all night in the morning she dies okay this is a sad story in almost like the whole old testament okay so the levite then cuts her into 12 pieces sends the pieces to the 12 tribes of israel and summons them to this place mizbah for judgment so the tribes judge gibeah where all this thing is happening guilty and they go to war against Kibia and the tribe of Benjamin. So in the first battles, 40,000 Israelites and 25,000 Benjamites die. <clears throat> and Gibeah is utterly destroyed and another 25,000 Benjamites are killed. So the rest of Israel makes peace with Benjamin, but a strange and unjust peace it is. No one would give their daughters to any man in Benjamin as a wife, okay? So because of this, we see that instead they capture 400 virgins from the clan of Jabesh Gilead, which did not answer the summons to come to Mizpah. Then they allow the Benjamites to abduct 200 young women going to Shiloh, where the Ark of the Covenant was kept, to dance and worship during the annual ceremony of the Lord. So we also see that the brutal gangbang of gang rape of an innocent woman leads to a war in which there's a great bloodshed. And then in order to forge a peace, 600 more women are abducted, okay? So the book of Judges ends with a brutal summarization. In those days, there was no king in Israel and everyone 
did what was right in his own eyes. This is how the book of Judges ends. Okay. So now, for the theological in interpretation, the first part is the first point is can Israel serve the Lord? Okay. So from the end of Genesis, the plot line has been if and when the Lord would restore the people to the promised land. By the end of Joshua, that promise has been fulfilled. But in the covenant renewal ceremony at the end of Joshua, a new plot line is introduced. Can Israel serve, serve the Lord? Israel had vowed to serve, serve, that is both to worship and serve the Lord. But Joshua had announced that you cannot serve the Lord. Okay, remember this part? And why he said this? Because in order to serve God, you had to be holy. Okay. <clears throat> So the book of Judges, which covers the roughly 200 years from 1220 to 1020 BC. Remember you were saying 400 years? It's 200 years. No, you were talking about Judges? or yeah, So it's 200 years from 1220 to 1020 BC. And demonstrates narratively that spite of strong leadership from many judges, Israel was not able to serve the Lord or not able to serve fully. The narrative strongly suggests that Israel's own spiritual frailty and infidelity are to blame. So Israel cannot stay faithful to the Lord, a theme that resonates throughout the historical books. So the second part is judges as commentary on human nature. Okay. This is the second point. So most people expect that all the Israelites in the Old Testament to be positive examples of Israelite faith, but they are not. In addition, the first question that most people ask of a biblical text is, what does this text tell me to do and not to do? Okay, that is the most people read the Bible, assuming that it is primarily an ethical text whose purpose is to instruct us in righteous living. So while that is true of some parts of the Bible, such as the Ten Commandments, it is not true of all texts, including most of the stories in the book of Judges and in the book as a whole. So the Bible, we know already is a powerful book because it's, it reveals many things. But sometimes it reveals something about God. Sometimes it reveals something about creation and sometimes it, in, as in the book of Judges, it also reveals something about humanity. Okay, so the questions that we have to ask is what does this text say and what does the text mean? Okay, <clears throat> so what does the book of Judges as a whole say? So overall, the story describes the massive disintegration of a relatively healthy and strong people to a completely unjust and unfaithful people. So in the beginning, they were healthy, but by the time the book of Judges ends, they are corrupt and they are destroyed. That healthiness is now like unhealthy. So there's a repeated cycle, okay? And this is your assignment, if you'll kind of, they forsook the, they forsook God, they worship foreign gods, they were given to oppression, then they called upon the Lord, they were delivered by a judge and having peace during the judge's life eventually develops to the point that even during the judge's lives there isn't any peace. Then we see the judges themselves bring violence inside Israel in the cases of Jephthah and Samson and after Samson there are no more judges, just mass anarchy, injustice, infidelity and violence. This is what happens after the last judge goes off the scene. So the group of the, the group rape of the Levite's concubine, in which he himself is complicit, and the ensuring civil war followed by the abduction of 600 more women is a story that sheds a brutal re revealing light on the human condition. Okay, human beings, even among God's people, are capable of great evil, okay? So the human condition is one of being born into a broken and sin-dominated world. There is an old theological maxim that states, it is not possible not to sin. Sin is inevitable. And where there is no law, where anarchy exists, sin will run wild. The situation within God's own holy people at the end of Judges 
is no better than it was in Genesis 6. Okay? When God saw that the inclination of the human heart was nothing but sin and violence and God was sorry that he had created humanity. Okay? So at the end of the book, the reader is left to wonder how will a God who promised not to destroy the world respond to his people when they are no better than humanity was before the flood. Okay? This is our class for today. Okay? So, remember the assignment now. Yeah, one second.